everybody. My name is uh, Guy Thomas. I'm the Director of Safety of uh, Dan Europe. And uh, thanks for joining me here at uh, Scuba Digital. And uh, let me get my presentation up and then we can start talking about diving safety. And you should be able to see the presentation now. So this evening, I would like to talk to you about mitigating risks during dive operation and how Dan actually is involved in all these uh, operations and the differences um, of, the, of the different projects that we actually are doing at the moment. First of all, let us take a look at what is safety. And if you look it up in a dictionary, you could find it's the condition of being protected from or unlikely to cause danger, risk or injury. And a danger is defined as a possibility that something harmful or something unpleasant will happen to you. A risk is a situation that involves an exposure to a danger and an injury, of course, is a damage to your body. Now, what we try to do when we talk about diving safety is like we like to educate divers. And we do this in different ways. And the first way we do it is by using and developing safety campaigns. Now, many of you might know Dan because we have a membership and we have a medical assistance line and we have we offer insurance through our uh, insurance company and the broker company. But actually, the mission of Dan is all about diving safety. It's about increasing diving safety, preventing accidents from happening, uh, avoiding problems from happening, and actually educating divers to become a safer diver. So we need to find a way to inform the divers how they could dive in a safer way. And we do this by a kind of risk mitigation through safety campaigns. And we have several safety campaigns at the moment. We have, for example, a campaign about propeller injuries. We have a campaign about air quality, which is called safety in the air. We have the release the pressure campaign that's all about ear and bar uh, sinus barotrauma injuries and how to avoid them. We have a safety campaign about don't get lost or what you need to do to avoid lost. And if you got lost, how you get who you would be able to get found, found again or faster. We have a, a, present, an, um, a safety campaign about uh, hydration uh, or about the problem when you are dehydrated. We have a safety campaign about the aging diver or more the medical issues that are very typical for those who become a little bit older. And I'm talking about 45 years and older. And it are normal medical conditions that happen to anyone, but maybe they have an influence or a negative influence on diving. So we have a campaign about that as well. And we have a campaign about the traveling diver. And this campaign is more about how you should prepare your next diving holiday. Obviously, in uh, this moment with COVID-19, traveling isn't uh, almost possible. But once COVID-19 would be over, people will start traveling again. What you would need to do to assess the risk, to be prepared if something happens on a holiday, um, how would you act? Uh, and here we very simply think on people who want to have exclusive diving in, for, for example, uh, Antarctica. They go to Antarctica, they have an accident, and now all of a the sudden they think that there is an airplane waiting for them to bring them to the, big, the closest by hyperbaric chamber. Obviously, it doesn't work that way. So we inform through the traveling diver campaign how you should um, plan your holiday on a safe way. We have another campaign as well. It's uh, more recommendations about COVID-19 and there's gonna be a presentation about this also during one of the next uh, couple of days. So this is safety campaigns. And I could talk hours about the different safety campaigns, but important is that what we try to do is we try to make these safety campaigns and inform divers. And although it is made especially for the normal diver, Obviously, also the professional diver uh, will find it very useful. Now, if you want to learn more about these campaigns, then you can very simply send an email to hira at danyurope.org. Or if you go to our website, you would find on the safety pages of the website uh, the possibility to download brochures, to, uh, to find some extra content. It might be a video, might be an article. 
And obviously we would appreciate if you make a link maybe from your website or if you use social media just to promote these campaigns. We are not selling anything in these campaigns. These campaigns they are simply made to educate uh, divers from the open water diver until the professional. So this is one of the first things we do to mitigate risks. We inform divers about possible problems that they could encounter because many times a diver doesn't know about the possible problem or doesn't consider the fact that when he goes diving and he's not well hydrated, there might be a problem. And we know that divers, for example, have very frequently the most common injuries amongst divers is ears, ear injuries. So we try to inform them and give them the needed information to avoid accidents. But as said, this is for the normal diver. Then we get to the hazard identification and the risk assessment program. Now, this is a program that we made no longer for the normal diver, but actually for the diving professional, for the dive center owner or for the manager of a dive center, dive club or a dive school. And what we need to ask ourselves is, how does a diver select a dive center at the moment? Well, normally people will select a dive center based on the destination. If I would like to go to Spain, to Spain, then I will select a dive center in the destination I want to visit. Same for Maldives or any other destination. It might be that I select my dive center uh, based on my budget. Uh, maybe that dive center is cheaper than the other one and my budget doesn't allow me to take the, the fancy expensive one. I'll take the one which is a little bit less uh, expensive. Maybe I will select my dive center based on the distance from my hotel, so it makes my travel a little bit easy. Uh, maybe the dive center is in the hotel, and that's why I selected that dive center. Maybe I do it because I would like to do wreck diving, tech diving. I, I'm, I, I select my make my selection based on the type of diving that I want to do. But how many divers actually do consider safety when they select the dive center? And the question here which pops up in my mind is, how would a diver know that a dive center works in a safe way? As a matter of fact, there is no clear identification that shows if a dive center works in a safe way. So all divers just presume dive centers works in a safe way because that's what you expect from a professional. But is this really so? In reality, unfortunately, the hazard identification and risk assessment principles, they are not very well known and it's not a very well used concept in the recreational diving industry. So why? Well, actually, most dive center owners or uh, professionals, they didn't do any specialized training in risk assessment. And many times, whatever they do is focused on the actual dives only. It is true that when you become a dive instructor, during your dive instructor course, you get taught how to teach a course in a safe way, how to uh, guide people, how to make sure that no accidents happen during courses. But there is nothing in the courses that talks about fire risks in the premises or dangers in a classroom or safety in a shop area in about emergency management or the need for safety drills. And we, we don't learn standard operational procedures, how to make them in a diving instructor course or in any diving course. And the same for emergency action plans. So what we try to do as Dan is we try to inform and we try to help the professionals in getting those meeting, missing bits and pieces uh, all together so they can make their own dive operations safer. In a matter of fact, the HIRA program helps the owners, the operators, the staff, the dive professional to identify the hazards before they lead to an injury or a loss. And how do we do it? Well, we actually are doing it by generating awareness amongst the professionals and the dive center owners. But you must realize as well that if we generate awareness amongst the professionals, who will benefit at the end will also be the normal diver. As we do with the safety campaigns, while we educate normal divers during the safety campaigns, we are educating dive centers and professionals through the HIRA campaign. 
And this risk, it's all about risk mitigation. It's about the use of safe diving principles. It's about risk assessment, understanding where the risks are in your dive center and how to avoid that these risks become a problem. It is about emergency preparedness, about your accident management capabilities and about your access to emergency services. You should consider these things when you offer diving services. And at the end of the day, what we really would like to have in a few years is we would like to see some safe dive destinations. And the safe dive destinations actually would be dive centers or, or better dive destinations where you have dive centers who work in a safe way, where you have uh, access to emergency medical services and where you have access to hyperbaric chambers. So that when you go diving, you could say, oh, if I go to, and I select that destination, I'm in good hands should emergency happen or the dive center is trying to do all possible to avoid emergencies from happening in the first place. I've mentioned standard operation procedures in emergency action plans. It's a lots of times that's not a really well understood concept. So I'll, 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 I'll use a few minutes of your, a few seconds of your time to explain a little bit more about these two concepts. A standard operation procedure is a written document that explains how to organize or how to do a specific task. And the aim is to create a streamlined, a streamlined and a standardized process. And what we are doing here is we are mitigating risk. We are avoiding accidents from happening. So for example, as a standard operation and procedure, we could think about uh, entry and exit uh, from the water. Why? Because we would like to avoid propeller hits. So we have a procedure in place that makes it possible for divers to enter in a safe way and to get back on board in a safe way. That's the procedure. Now it says written documents. Why? If I would go to a standard dive center and I would ask him, for example, how do you perform this task? Maybe that instructor will explain me something which I think is makes sense. And now I'm asking it to another instructor and he tells me, Another thing makes sense as well, but it's not the same. Now we have confusion. Imagine if you have a procedure that explains how people should get on board of the, um, of the boat, of the diving boat. And one says, okay, please first all your equipment on board, then you wait, and then we will tell you when it's time to come on board. Now the other, inst the other instructor says, just go on board. That's confusion. That's not the way it should be. Emergency action plans, on the contrary, that's again a written document, but it explains how to act or react in an emergency. So actually, it tells us what to do if the standard operational procedure for one or the other reason didn't work or something unforeseen happened. So an emergency action plan might be, for example, how to act in case of a fire. And again here, written because First of all, you would like to tell all your staff members how to act or react in a safe, in, a, in the same way. And secondly, a written document will only also protect you in case of uh, lawsuits, because we also have to consider liability. And what you are doing when you make emergency action plan is you actually mitigate the damage of potential events that could endanger a people or an organization's ability to function safely. So what we try to do is we try to get these concepts over to the professionals, to the dive centers, because if these procedures and the emergency plans are actually in, uh, in place, the diver would be able to dive in a much safer way. So why do we need procedures and plans, emergency plans, avoiding confusion, that's what I said before, to make sure we are prepared, because if I make a procedure, and in my procedure I request a certain material, then I need to make sure this material is available. The same for the emergency plan. If I say that in case of emergency, oxygen needs to be given, then I need an oxygen unit and I need staff that is trained to use the oxygen unit. At the end, I'm doing it to protect my clients, my staff members, the facilities, my assets and the environment. We all know that dive accidents might happen, so we should get prepared. And also, it's all about liability risk mitigation. Because if you are a professional or a dive center owner and an accident happened, 
you need to prove that you've done everything possible to avoid that accident from happening in the first place. And you will be able to prove it if you have written documents that show that you have done uh, certain things. So how can dive centers and dive professionals actually participate in uh, HIRA? Well, we have three levels. On the first two levels, you can very simply uh, participate by filling in an online questionnaire. It is self-assessment, but obviously we will uh, check the answers to make sure that the minimum requirements, uh, requirements as we uh, requested are met. And um, we might even ask you, obviously, some proof of what you are declaring. If you uh, pass the level one or the level two, you will receive an email with a certificate and we will invite you to participate in the next level. And this is something which is, is for free. It's for free for members, it's for free, it's for free for business partners. When it comes to level three, it's no longer online. Level three is actually a full risk assessment of the diving operation. Let it be a school, a club, or a dive center. And what we try to do is we try to educate the professional to do the risk assessment himself. And therefore, we developed the HIRA guide, which is a guide which actually divides the diving operations in separate zones in the reception, in the equipment area, in the air filling area, in a classroom, in a boat, in a swimming pool. We identified all possible risks in, the, in those areas. And then we also wrote how to mitigate those risks. So by using the guide, you can really make a full um, hazard identification risk assessment in your dive operation. And then you have also the possibility to improve the points which might be problematic or which might not have been taken care of yet. Obviously, this is not a small job. You would actually need a diving safety officer or a DSO in order to do that. And so you need a, one person who is taking care to perform that kind of risk assessment. And the same person obviously will be the person responsible then for the development of the uh, standard operation procedures and the emergency action plans. And this brings us to a third thing that we do when it comes to uh, risk mitigation. We started with the safety programs. We made the safety programs to educate divers, to avoid accidents um, because divers don't understand the risks. Then we made HIRA. We make HIRA to mitigate risks for dive centers and professionals in their daily operation, aiming at avoiding diving accidents from happening, so making it safer again for the normal diver. But sometimes we take a step more and uh, we get involved uh, at some very interesting projects on international level. And I would just like to introduce one of these projects because this project is about risk mitigation and you might not expect that we are actually um, doing these kind of things. So Dive Safe is a project which receives funding from the European Maritime and the Fishery Fund. Uh, and this is a program of the European Commission. This project runs from the 1st of January 2019 until the 31 of December 2021. There are eight partners in this program. Uh, we have universities, uh, uh, commercial entities who develop materials, and then we have Dan inside. And Dan is taking care of the safety aspect and the medical aspect of this project. Dive Safe will actually integrate a number of diving related technologies, equipment and apps into a comprehensive solution allowing for a more efficient and a safe scientific and professional diving mission. What does that mean? Diving safe, the dive safe system is actually an underwater scooter equipped with payloads and a main board, um, which is manageable from an underwater tablet. It has an underwater tablet, as I said, with a camera and apps for surveying, navigation and mission planning. It has a diver localization system based on the USBL methods, and it uses wearable sensors for breathing, heartbeat, and glycemia monitoring. 
And th that last thing is something that obviously Dan is involved with because that's the medical part of this uh, system. It also uses an acoustic modem to support the USB localization and communication channel for relying, uh, relaying data such as the positioning of the diver and the diver's health to the surface. Now we are inside this project for the medical part, but also for the safety part. Oops, okay. So this is just a, a, a drawing of how it, it looks. You have a diver, he uses, um, um, in this case, uh, on the water scooter from Suex, and on that scooter, you will find a docking station with a USB-L antenna. You have a depth and a water temperature uh, measurement, an external camera, a cradle with a tablet attached, the breathables, the breathe rate sensor, the tank pressure sensor, a heart rate sensor, glycemic sensor. And we need to make sure that during this project, everything is done and organized in a safe way. So one of our tasks, other than the medical part in this project, is actually making sure that the product which is developed through this European project is actually safe. Um, so who will use this dive safe? It will be used by the, oh, no, sorry, at the uh, right side of the screen, you just have an over a small, it's, it's a mix between a drawing and a picture. You see a diver using the underwater scooter. We will have some pictures later, you can see it better. And you have data transmission from below the surface to the USB-L transceiver on the boat. And from there, we can actually send the signal through a satellite to the other side of the world. So in principle, a person who would be diving in let's say Antarctica, we would be able to see in the UK the heart rate of this person. Now, it's, uh, you say, oh, wow, but who's going to use it? Well, it's going to be used by scientific divers, for example, archaeologists or biologists who intend to use it for their research work. Um, they, for example, they could go over an area and because of the localization, we could have pictures taken every x seconds and the system would know exactly the position of that picture so when there is a wreck or when there is um, something special for biologists we will be able to make pictures in a very short time and to get a 3d composition of what actually is being seen under the water obviously it might also be interesting for the public safety divers or uh, police forces they could use it as a tool for their investigations. Maybe there, there is a car under the water or maybe there is something that collapsed and it's partially under the water and they can take pictures and map it in a very fast and uh, safe way. It could also be used by dive centers and scuba divers in relation to tourism services and to support underwater adventures. It could be like a virtual guide that takes me to a reef, that takes me to um, a, a wreck, whatever. It could be used by marine protected areas and other regional authorities that involve sea protection and monitoring. So if I know that in a certain area, I have a population of a certain kind of coral or fish, I could do this this year and next year I could go exactly the same on exactly the same spot and I could compare it immediately, uh, almost in real time because of the data acquisition. And also commercial and technical divers who run survey contracts on the seabed, they can use it. It makes their operations probably safer and faster. Imagine, you know as well, if we go deep, time is very limited. So by, using, by winning time, by helping them to improve the acquisition of photos and localization, they would be able to do the same job on a shorter time, thus making it also more safe for them. Um, here I'm going to show you some pictures on the left side of the screen. You actually see the what we call the high-end user um, product. And um, high-end user means actually the more expensive product because obviously um, they are planning to make two models of this on the water scooter with all the software and hardware on top. And depending on what, what it's going to be used for, and this is the, the more complete version. 
And what you notice on this picture is you see like this, uh, it's not yellow, it's like beige um, cubes, let's say, because what is actually happening is if these companies who are developing all this hard and software, adding stuff to the, um, in this case, the Suex uh, uh, scooter, what would happen is that the floatability changes and you, it might become too heavy. So we are adding uh, floatable de floating devices to it to make sure that the buoyancy is, uh, is kept the same way. Obviously, this is under development, so the, the, the final product might look different. This is just a test. This is the prototype. So the, the guy would go underwater with it, and he uses it first here in a swimming pool to make sure that it's, uh, it, it's easy to use. And once the tests are positive, as they were, the same uh, scooter will be taken to uh, open water or to lake and in, to the sea, and we'll do more tests to make sure it's safe to use and if all the technical parts and uh, hardware and software works. On the right side of the screen, you see how they are attaching at the moment uh, the, uh, the tablet uh, to, the, um, to the scooter. The tablet is um, just a close up to, to make you understand where it is. You, you can do a lot of things with a tablet. You can communicate with the surface. It gives you my medical data, but it also can show you the area that I want to discover underwater. And you can see it because in the middle of the, almost in the middle of the tablet, you can see that uh, red square with a cross. And this is the area. This is what I call the mission that I'm planning. I would like the scooter to do this during the dive or better the diver to do this during the dive. And uh, at the right side, you see a computer screen, which actually follows the diver during the dive and shows how he, uh, his, what he did, what he navigated, what was his direction and the depth and everything. So here a little bit uh, better pictures of the products, just to give you an idea of how uh, the product at the moment looks like. Because again, it's a prototype. This is something that is being developed by these companies. And uh, so the end model, the end user model will look different. I've, I've mentioned before that was the high end user product. What you see now is the low end user product or the cheaper version. It's a Yamaha scooter. It also has the, uh, the screen. It has a different kind of navigation system on it. And this would be uh, cheaper at the end of the day, but of course it would be limited in what it'd be able to do. And also here, we had to add some floatable uh, devices to it to make sure that uh, the balance is still okay. Some pictures of it underwater. You can see some uh, Italian carabinieri or police divers using it in a swimming pool. And on the picture of on the, on the right side, you actually see the black thing in the middle which is the uh, USB-L transmitter. That's what's supposed to be uh, at to the boat or connected to the boat. And by that, we are able to get an exact position of where the diver is during the dive. And uh, that's what uh, the introduction that I wanted to give to you tonight. And uh, I would like to show this slide. It says, whatever you wear, then is there because we never say it to anybody. The only people who know is those who looked at or watched my presentation. But if you one day you buy damn clothing, then just look on the clothing tag and you will always find a safety message because safety is what we do. So I'd like to thank you uh, for your time and attention. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can follow it. You can send it to us by email at hire at danyarup.org or I can of course also answer in a um, few seconds the uh, any questions that there might be popping up in the chat room okay guy thank you thank you very much for your presentation um i think there's been a few people who've been watching i'm not sure if you were aware that your presentation itself didn't actually appear on the screen but you did a very good presentation oh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't i couldn't see my own screen no, that's fine. So, you know, some people could see you, could see you, everybody could see you, that's not a problem. And, and the presentation came across. So I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't know if we have any questions from the, from the stage. Is there anybody out there that has questions for Guy? 
We'll just give them a moment to have a, have a, a chance to type something if they do have any questions. And in the meantime, whilst we're waiting for those, I would just like to remind people that um, there is actually a prize draw taking place in just under 10 minutes time here on the main stage. If you want to win that prize, A, you have to be in the main stage area to win it. Um, and B, you may be asked to do something in the text. So keep yourself ready for that. Um, email address. Freddie, you're saying email address, please, for, for Guy Thomas? Uh, I think he probably wants to, to chat with you, Guy, um, at some point. Freddie, you can always look Guy up in the People tab so that you can actually have a chat with him there. Okay. Well, there doesn't seem to be any questions here right now, but uh, Freddie, just please look Guy up in the People tab. Okay. All right. I'm sorry that you couldn't see my screen. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do we. <laughs> Okay, Guy, let's try and sort that out for next time, because I believe you're on again later on in the weekend. Is that right? No, not me. Not you. Okay, must be another one. Okay, okay. take care, Guy, and we'll Thank speak to you and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.